Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by Plants. Plants. Today, we bring to you episode 296, Heart Disease Impacts Us All, with Dr. Shane Williams. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talked to Dr. Shane Williams, and we did talk about cardiology a lot. We talked about the heart a lot. We talked about hypertension, sugars, oils, cholesterol. We really broke it down in simple terms so that you could have a better sense of what some of these terms are and how they are affecting our body. We think you're going to find it really surprising to find out what the number one killer of cardiologists is as well. And we really do think that this is a great episode that you could share with anyone with heart disease, anyone who you fear may have heart disease, and your doctors as well. It's so amazing to find out that there are plant-based doctors close to us, and there are doctors that are starting to use plant-based nutrition as a way of helping their patients. And Dr. Williams is one of those who's really making a difference and leading the charge at doing so. He was born in Newfoundland and he attended Memorial University in St. John's where he obtained his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy. And he also did a four-year Doctor of Medicine and a three-year postgraduate fellowship program in internal medicine at Memorial as well. He went on to complete a three-year cardiology subspecialty fellowship at McMaster University in Hamilton. And in 2008, he moved to Muskoka, Ontario to open his private practice in cardiology and internal medicine. Dr. Williams has lectured at plant-based conferences. He's hosted many week-long immersion programs locally, as well as a 10-day plant-based immersion summit in the Caribbean with Drs. Campbell and Esselstyn, along with other leaders in the field. Dr. Williams is so passionate about bringing this information to as many people as possible so that they can become empowered to both safeguard and improve their quality of health. For those of you in the Toronto and surrounding areas, he will be speaking at the Canadian Plant-Based Nutrition Conference on June the 1st, 2019. And there will be some other amazing doctors there, some of which have been on our podcast before, uh, like Dr. Jenkins, who was on episode 266, Dr. Linda Plowright, who was on 248, and Dr. Meta, who was on 280. We will put links in our show notes to the event, the Canadian Plant-Based Nutrition Conference, so that if you are interested in going to it, you'll be able to click through and get there. We'll also put links to all those other episodes of those doctors that I just mentioned, and of course, the show notes at planttrainers.com slash 296. We want to thank everyone for their support with the Yummy Foods Activity Book for Kids that we recently published and is now available on Amazon and Kindle. We know it's being used in homeschooling programs as community outreach materials, as well as a way to keep kids busy learning and having fun without electronics. We wanted to share a few testimonials. Happy customers have left. And this one's from Jessica. I love learning about new foods. Still being a fairly new vegan family, I would love for them to learn even more. I was pleasantly surprised when we received the workbooks and every one of my children, ages 1, 3, 8, 10, 12, and 16, took interest. Wow. Well done, Shoshana and Adam. This book is interesting, fun, informative, and I feel good about the fact that my kids are not only wanting to play with it, but they are learning at the same time. Win-win. This one's from Timothy. The recipe activities are great. No stress. It's a way to bond with your kids in the kitchen and teach basic kitchen skills. I recommend it for homeschooling, church-based programs, and presentations to elementary school kids. The worksheets can also be used as fun activities to test basic food literacy knowledge in adult-based presentations. To get yourself or a young one a copy, visit the link in our show notes, which is planttrainers.com slash yummy foods, or search yummy foods on your country's Amazon site. And now for a moment of gratitude. I'm really grateful for all the tools that I have in my tool belt, the tools that have been able to help me with my health issues that I've had along the way, but also be able to help other people. Recently, I have a woman who has alopecia, so patches of hair on her head that are refusing to grow with 
bald patches and she's had to wear a wig for a very long time. Not only is she not on the medications that she needed that caused the alopecia, but her hair has actually started growing back. And I'm just so grateful to be able to help people feel confident and feel healthier. I'm grateful to be able to bring this episode to our audience, another amazing doctor. And I know last week we had Dr. Ornish on the show. It's just incredible that we're able to connect with these brilliant minds to share a, such an important message with our audience. And I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to network and to grow my personal education and share it with others. Dr. Shane Williams, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. And thanks for having me. Fellow Canadian, before we get into our big conversation today, we wanted to know if you had a moment of gratitude to share with us and our listeners. I do, vitamin G. I'm very happy to be uh, a Canadian trained cardiologist, able to be able to give this plant-based message to my patients and see them see them get better on a daily basis. It's it's totally revolutionized how I practice medicine, this message, and I'm so glad I was in the right place to hear about it at the right time. So I'm, I have a lot of gratitude for that. Where was that place in time? That place in time was uh, on the web, on an Amazon website when I ordered uh, the China study in December of 2010. Wow. So that's pretty awesome. And Dr. T. Colin Campbell has put his imprint on a lot of us and we talked to him on the show in episode 286 for our listeners that haven't heard that one they can go back and click on that one in our show notes for today's show so it's not very common for us in this area to come across doctors that are plant-based and that are proponents of the plant-based lifestyle who actually talk to their patients about it so how did you get into the plant-based movement other than just coming across the China study, there must have been more to that story. You know, when I think back, so I, I had, I ordered that book and I had no idea what the China study was about. I, I, I now, I've since met and know Colin Campbell personally, and he laughs when I tell him the story that uh, I didn't know what the China study book was about. I thought it was a book about like Walmart uh, purchasing patterns or something. <laughs> and um, I had no idea what it was. And I bought a few other cardiology books that had color pictures in them and I got the box back home one day and and threw the China study sort of underneath the bed and and read the cardiology books first mm. and it was t out of sheer boredom I came across the China study one night and started reading it and was um, quite frankly shocked that there was so much research up to that point showing the major impact of nutrition not only that you know, our grandmother is right that you should eat your vegetables in terms of prevention, but to be able to take advanced disease and reverse it with diet. I, I must say, I read it with some skepticism, and, and uh, Colin also laughs at this guy. I thought, who's this Colin Campbell character? Is he like some kind of a crazy person? Like, And I realized, no, he's actually uh, nutrition science at Cornell, very legitimate with 300 peer-reviewed articles, 300 plus. So then I had to sort of challenge some of my pre-formed and pre-educated assumptions about nutrition that it's not only a slight impact on advanced disease to reverse it, but it, it's it's a therapeutic option, really. And what did you use to back up the China study? So where did you go next? So, I mean, I contacted Colin a few months later, uh, or let me roll back. So I read this, uh, the China study. Uh, in it, he mentioned uh, work of uh, Ornish, who I'd heard about Dean Ornish in, in cardiology training, but it, it was felt I didn't know a whole lot about it. And it was sort of poo-pooed and dismissed and insulted as, oh, as a diet you could never stick to. And then I came across uh, the work of Esselstyn through, through Campbell and, and saw the work that Esselstyn was doing in reversing coronary disease. So at that point, I said, this is worth to give it a try. So I changed my diet in the spring of 2011. And in about 10 weeks, I lost 22 pounds and uh, all the weight fell off me. And I was, uh, it was bad because I only had a, a couple of pairs of pants and a couple of shirts to wear. I couldn't fit into any of my other clothes. And I wasn't ready to give it away because I was thinking, when is the weight coming back? And that was seven or eight years ago and the weight hasn't come back. 
so when I saw the effect in me, I started mentioning it to patients. And within four to six weeks when they're getting the follow-up blood work done and they return to clinic, uh, started noticing a very significant change in these patients that I'd never noticed before with just the quote-unquote right amount of meds or the new med added and so forth. So it, it made me think there's something really to this. So it was then the summer of 2011, spring, summer, and I started to think, this is extraordinary. I think I need to make a documentary about this. And literally within three days, the official launching of Forks Over Knives happened. So um, so Forks Over Knives is the documentary I didn't have to spend $200,000 to make. So I'm, I'm very, I have a lot of gratitude for that. Too. <laughs> so that's how it took off. So that's amazing. A lot of people come on and tell us that uh, Forks Over Knives was what got them started in the first place. And the fact that you found it completely by accident is amazing. And if you had the 22 pounds to lose and kept it off, you know, it gets me thinking the number one killer of people in general in North America is heart disease. I'm assuming that the number one killer of cardiologists in North America is heart disease as well. You're correct. Yeah. So we have all of these doctors who are doing the very best, but mean it from the bottom of their hearts, trying to help their patients to get better. And they're in fact dying of the of the same thing that they're trying to keep other people from dying for that that's a serious issue that we have going on here and i'm hoping that more and more people are going to be finding out about a plant-based diet or cardiologists are going to be finding out about a plant-based diet not by accident do you know what the plant-based movement is like here in canada amongst doctors you know it's been slow because in 2013 or so we started doing uh what we call weekly lunch and learn uh, group counseling seminars here on plant-based nutrition and it's been gradually growing and and I think in in this area where I live Bracebridge and Muskoka I, I like to think over the past uh, six years or so that and I've, I've heard it from many patients that they sort of are helping to educate their doctors on the information and it may not be a way that we often think of how people are educated but there's been other scenarios in history. I understand back in the 60s when, when the suggestions from the medical people to, to quit smoking or reduce their smoking was a factor. It's often the child who was educated in the schools who came home and said, Mommy and Daddy, I don't want you to die. Would you please stop smoking? So in the same way, it's, it's patients, I find, who with some diplomacy are having success and starting to make their physicians sit up and take notice when they come back with dramatic improvements in blood pressure and weight and cholesterol in anginal symptoms, etc. So I like to think it's, it's, it's getting better every time I've right from the beginning, when I started this, I had a core of about a dozen family physicians who were strongly supportive and the rest were either had no opinion and very few were, Oh no, that's BS. And, uh, that that's not the right way to go. So I think, over the past six years, there's been a significant shift in our region that that uh, that makes this more felt to be more legitimate. And then with the very much bureaucratic miracle of the Canada Food Guide, I think now this gives us some legitimacy to say that, you know, like Gretzky say, you don't go where the puck is, you go to where the puck's going to be. And um, people are realizing now that that we've been making sense by by pushing the you know the gospels of. Campbell and, and Esselstyn because it, it, it wasn't a gospel. It was it was scientific fact. There's all of these scientific facts out there, but you keep hearing from bloggers, podcasters, doctors, what have you, that the culprit for heart disease is sugar. And if you take sugar out of the picture, then that's going to be the, the one thing that's going to keep you living longer and living healthier. So I know that sugar is important, but why don't you speak to the audience a little bit and tell them where sugar really plays in and where how it compares to actually eating plant-based itself. You know, I, I think in a, in a lot of these areas, and even you hear the plant-based physicians, some of them argue over you need so many nuts and seeds, you need so many for essential oils, or you don't need this, or you don't need a supplement, or you do. So I, I find in some ways, if we focus on the big picture to get people to change their diet, uh, that's more effective than fighting over some macronutrient because because if you get people away from animal and processed foods i tend to agree from what i've read that a lot of these high fructose corn syrups and and high simple sugary foods 
are not good things, but they tend to go along with the process and the animal-based foods. And I also, I mean, the other thing as you start learning about some of the dynamics here, and I don't want to get too political, but you, you start possibly uh, seeing some of these um, information programs as it, you think about it, if, if, I'm, if I'm in the beef or the dairy industry and I can somehow line up sugar as the, as the culprit, then it'll take away my culpability as being a source of a lot of unhealthy, uh, you know, things in, in your diet. So I, I think I really think sugar is is massively overplayed as a culprit in terms of chronic disease. But that being said, yes, if you eat a lot of simple sugars and processed sugars, it can't be good, but it tends to go along with an eating pattern that also tends to have high fat animal based foods. So teasing, teasing it out in terms of a scientific way. I think it's a little bit challenging, and that's probably the reason why there's been so mo much movement to oversimplify it and just say it's it's simply sugar. I, I don't think it is. Yeah, it's very easy to just blame one thing, and looking at the big picture, it's really, obviously you cut out the processed foods, that's going to make a difference on its own, but when you think long term, just making that one shift is not necessarily going to solve any illnesses or diseases that you've accumulated over the years, it's going to take more than just uh, cutting out those simple sugars to really safeguard yourself against a heart attack or heart disease or the cancers that are out there. I agree that it's the big picture we need to look at. And I mean, I have a number of uh, East Indian patients who um, have kind of shown me too that it's it's not just the meat either, right? Uh, you know, I got a, one... Uh, guy in his 40s now he grew up in north america but eats he's he's uh he's hindu and uh and eats no animal products except dairy and uh would would tend to have a lot of fat so this particular poor fellow is in his 40s and he required triple bypass surgery so you know like um another area that that esselstyn has always talked about is the added oils and i i must say and 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 uh, if Esselstyn ever hears this, maybe, uh, I, I don't know. He, I must say, first, when I heard the message about more plants and a no added oil diet to reverse vascular disease, I did think, just like a lot of people think, okay, now that's pretty extreme. But if you just get them off the meat and the processed foods, won't you have done well? I think you will have done well. But I'm also realizing, like is the case with your parents and grandparents, at the time, they give you the advice and you think, oh, they're just foolish and old fashioned. But 20 or 30 years later, you realize, damn it, they were right all along that the oil part of this uh, factor and people with active vascular disease is very, very critical key component. We've had people here with angina that couldn't be improved with medication, couldn't be stented, couldn't have bypass. And within a few weeks of restricting the oil intake, had a significant improvement in their anginal symptoms. So I think there's a number of these highly processed food areas, including simple sugars and oils, added oils, that are, that are also contributing to this epidemic, not just meat per se. Yeah, and Dr. Esselstyn's been on the show as well, and he did focus a lot on the oils because we were questioning about that. And obviously, if you are somebody that has heart disease or you're looking to reverse or even prevent it in some cases, you're going to want to listen to his protocol because he has the evidence to show that it does work. But there is a place for oil and a lot of other people will argue that point. So nutrition is very confusing. And I think if we could simplify things by focusing on the big picture rather than the reductionism and focusing on one nutrient or macronutrient or micronutrient, we could become a much healthier society by just eating more plants and understanding how our body uses the nutrition properly. And I can't agree more. And that's kind of how I approach and have learned, I think, hopefully learned of different approaches over the years of what will, what will ultimately lead to a sustained behavior change. And, and I find... Yes, the perfect diet has no added oils, in my opinion, vascularly speaking, has no added oils, no animal products, etc. But that sometimes that degree of perfectionism can be so overwhelming for some people that they basically lose, you lose all connection with those people then. So if I can get them to eat halfway healthy for the first three months, get them feeling better, and then 
through their improved uh, physical and, and improved mental health, quite frankly, as well, then they're in a better state to be able to take on a higher demanding kind of a program that I think a lot of people need a warm up period, because if you throw the book at them too hard too early, you're going to lose your chance of developing a rapport with that patient. And they feel then that you're threatening them or you're the enemy when you're really trying to do it for their own good. But sometimes there's techniques you and you learn the hard way that uh, coming on strong too early with this kind of a message and giving a go all or go home attitude uh, can can sometimes backfire in a behavioral uh, approach. Absolutely. I had some clients that were about to onboard with me to figure out how they were going to change their diet. They had just heard about a plant-based diet. It, there was extreme cancer case with also heart disease and they had expected to go plant-based or at least mostly plant-based. And then I had said something about, and then down the line, we'll see when we can make a switch over to oil free. And because it wasn't something that they were familiar with and they were already overwhelmed with changing their diet already, they, they were out. Like they were completely yeah. out. So as, you know, as, as a doctor or as a nutritionist or a wellness coach, we need to understand what our patients need. And of course, extreme circumstances call for extreme protocol, but we still need to understand the people, the people themselves. So having said all of that, you introduce these patients to a plant-based lifestyle. I'm sure a lot of them haven't necessarily heard about it or for sure considered it before. So let's really break down that idea of how do you keep them from being overwhelmed when you have them in your office for 15 minutes and you say, we need to go plant-based now. There's so much more great information coming your way. But before we get to that, we wanted to share with you our three personal complaints that we have about cookbooks. And maybe you've heard this before, but sometimes we just don't know where to get the ingredients. Sometimes we buy an ingredient and we use so little of it that we have so much left over. What a waste for so many reasons. And number three, you know that if there's no picture, I'm not making it. I want to see how they made it so that I could change it in my mind and make it exactly how I want it. And a bonus complaint is that we're just busy. I don't have time to spend three hours making some kind of fluffy thing that's not going to turn out properly. So that's why we created the Easy Recipes for Busy Parent cookbook. That's why we created the Easy Recipes for Busy Parents. This cookbook promises that you will find all the ingredients in no time, that we will use the same ingredients over and over again so that you don't have a lot of wastage or any wastage at all. And it'll be easy and there will be pictures for every single recipe. If that's good enough for you, check out the link in the show notes or go to planttrainers.com slash shop and get your cookbook today. And now back to the show. So what I do is I, I, some, I often encourage them, you know, that don't change their, their eating habits at all. Just come out for the hour once a week and let us um, let us offer you some some kind of a plant based meal that we have catered here with a recipe to just start introducing it very gently as a concept while I introduce to them some basic signs around look at the impact of uh, eating on many of these chronic diseases that you're taking medications for that have a bunch of side effects uh, and most people don't like taking medications that there are alternate ways of addressing these problems that are safer, cheaper, and in fact, more effective. So I, I, I try to make the sales pitch in a, don't do anything right now, just listen to me and let me point out to you a number of reputable people like Campbell, Esselstyn, and McDougall in the field who are highly scientifically referenced and encourage them to go into their various resources and just start reading it, start learning about it, and don't expect, oh, yeah, we got to go 100% from day one. Just let them put their toe in the pool and go gentle. That's generally how I take it as a group approach. So I love that. And that's so duplicatable by other physicians and other cardiologists who are listening to the show. You basically lure them out with a meal and say, you know, come and listen, come and eat, and we'll talk about what we're going to do next from there so that you're actually giving them the science. You're getting a lot of people at once and you don't have the time to do that with each individual sitting in the office so this is something that you do above and beyond your nine to five exactly and like a no commitment thing just like you know like if you were 
trying to sell condominiums or something. And unfortunately, they're very effective at that. Like uh, just a no commitment approach where nobody gets browbeaten for eating hamburgers or refusing to change their diet. We don't you don't have to stand up and tell us what you eat every day. That's none of our business. It's only whatever your level of comfort there is. And I find, yeah, not everybody is going to listen to that and, and change their eating habits. But I think if you're going to have somebody who's on the edge and is at the whatever the stage of change, the pre-contemplative or a contemplative ready to switch to change, if you hit them at that sweet spot with that easy approach, there'll be a bunch of them will start trusting you and realizing, oh yeah, this is legitimate. And then we'll be get more and more involved with it. And then as they get more and more involved with it, as you guys already know, then it sells itself. Right? Right. So, so yeah, so it's kind of where, where's that step after now that you've got their attention, now that you've got them the science, you've got them believing, you send them home with that one recipe of what they ate that day. But how do you convince them that they're able to do it? They're able to change the way that they've been eating for the last 60 years and the meals that they've been making themselves for the last 40 years. And they know what to do with a can of chickpeas or some tempeh or what is this kale you talk about? Yeah. And, and it takes it takes a, sometimes it takes a while because I remind people, too, though, that, you know, most of us, you know, on the good news, bad news is most of us eat generally the same six or eight or 10 meals in cycle rotation. So if you can learn a new meal, one new meal a week, you know, even forget meatless Mondays, although it's not a bad concept, just one new meal a week within two or three months. Now you got a You've got eight or ten meals in your in your toolbox that you can start introducing, start uh, perfecting. Uh, we encourage people to, you know, to be tips about making stuff in batch. Make sure you're going to reheat stuff, freeze things up, because the complaint of my God, plant based eating just takes a lot more cooking time. And okay, I think in general there's gradations of that, of course, but in general I think it does. But if you can take an hour to cook. Uh, uh, what will turn out to be four or five meals, now you're you're making a lot more efficient use of your time. So over the course of a few months, for those who continue to be interested, we, we, we gradually introduce that. We, we have all the references here that we can get books in people's hands right away, too. We, we actually started to go locally and to try and get a lot of the uh, libraries and bookstores locally to carry a lot of these plant-based books, and some did and some wouldn't. So we decided a little bit uh, hesitantly to sort of basically become a, a bookstore here. And and mainly because once I introduce the concept, I want to get that book and those resources in somebody's hands right away. I don't want to have to make them do one more extra step that's going to run the risk of them going home and forgetting about me. So just the timing of it. And uh, we find you do that enough times, whether that's a few hundred times a year, you'll get 100 people who start taking this seriously. And you're not going to bat 1,000%, but if you can bat 40 to 60%, you're going to make a big impact. Are these patients ones that already have heart disease, that are already sick, or are these just people that are coming through interested? Mostly these are people who are on prescription meds, are being treated for some chronic condition, most commonly high blood pressure. My view on high blood pressure, just a little plug for that, you know, in training and a lot of the literature on hypertension or at least a lot of the material uh, public service information is watch your sodium intake. Uh, my view of hypertension, and I'm not a hypertensive expert, but my view of hypertension through this experience has completely changed. I see hypertension now much the say, same way I see diabetes. It's a fat toxicity. Because um, if I get people to eat plant-based and reduce their fat intake as a result, most people's blood pressure in the course of days, certainly to weeks, will markedly go down. We had one guy here, just a case I want to share with you, a few weeks ago. He was referred to me about six weeks ago. His family doctor sent a referral, blood pressure 230 over 130, and his heart rate was 130 at rest. Hmm. And now those numbers are enough to scare any physician. He was referred to me, and I was set up to see him a, a few weeks later. But 10 days before he came to see me, he was at the local hockey arena and heard, was speaking to somebody about our program. And they said, well, before you go see Shane, you should watch Forks Over Knives and start eating healthier and give it a shot. He was a truck driver. Uh, he actually did a really good job. For 10 days, he ate plant-based. He lost 10 pounds, was still overweight, 
and he dropped his blood pressure when I saw him in clinic to 130 over 70 and a resting heart rate of 70 wow. in 10 wow. days. Wow. So, and I've had case after case after case of that, of four meds, blood pressure out of control, now eating better, plant-based, and no meds and blood pressure better than ever. So that's one of the number one diagnoses in Canada, high blood pressure. And too many people, I think, are going around focusing on sodium as the culprit. I really think part and parcel with a plant-based diet, the low-fat diet, or the high-fat diet, should I say, of American diets, is really the course for vascular resistance and high blood pressure. I think most people are on blood pressure pills, really. They don't need to be on them if they knew a bit more about nutrition. So would you say that the whole sodium and, and keep sodium out of your diet is the same to um, blood pressure as don't eat carbohydrates and don't eat sugars is to diabetics? It's I putting think it's, a band I think it's on almost it. the same. Yeah, I think it's almost the same. I think there may be some people, they, they used to train us that some people are salt sensitive. Some people maybe are, are particularly sensitive to salt, but either case with a plant-based diet, you're automatically going to get going to get less sodium as well. And you're automatically going to get less fat. So is your improvement related to the sodium or the fat? I would put more money on it being related to the fat. But of course, if you're getting improvement from that eating pattern in general, we won't fight over why you're better. We're just happy you're better. But I think it's the fat, actually. The fat could be the root cause. I, I really think case. it's the root cause in most people. Can you explain to people the connection between high cholesterol and high blood pressure? Well, the connection in my observation of it is, is, is high cholesterol tends to be associated with animal-based foods and, um, and processed foods. And those same foods are associated with high fat, uh, which, which aggravates high blood pressure. So I think it's the company that they both keep is they both tend to be a symptom of the same eating patterns. All right. So... How important is 100% compliance? So you have these people who are starting to change their diet and they go on vacation and they start eating fish again or they are like Monday to Friday, they're doing great and then they go out with their friends on the weekend and they don't feel like making a fuss. Do you see a huge difference between the people who are 100% compliant and those that might be 80 or 90% compliant? It depends on how sick they are. So in the very sick, meaning folks with, flow limiting coronary disease angina with minimal exertion i have had people who who had a significant improvement under angina but continue to have some exertional chest pain for years eating plant based but like like i mentioned earlier those who continue to use some oils and when i say some oils you'll be very surprised the difference it make i i think of one particular man who um he had two or three bypass surgeries, multiple angioplasties, and he had blockages finally in areas that they couldn't get to with a catheter to deploy stents. So he had angina for years. He switched to plant-based. His angina went from a class three, which is ex exertional chest pain with minimal exertion, uh, down to a class one, which was uh, exertion, with, which is chest pain with, with intense exertion. He was like that for two years, and then his angina started to get a little bit worse. And we looked at his diet, and he said to me, he said, I don't want anybody to come near me with a catheter. I know where the blockages are. I just like to have a better quality of life. So we looked at his diet. We went through his diet with a fine-tooth comb. It was better than most people's diets who I know. The only amount of added oil he was using was a spray of Pam spray on the pan once a day. And I said to him, I remember saying to him that, this may not make that much of a difference, but let's give it a try. Your, your back is against the wall here. You're having symptoms. You don't want any more intervention. Let's give it a shot. What have you got to lose? So I convinced him to, to stop the PAM spray for a month. Within two weeks, his angina was gone away. Mm -hmm. And he was a very, very mechanical, disciplined fellow who ate the same thing every day, had the same level of activity every day, maintained the same weight, was a non-smoker. Uh, and the only simple change he made was probably three to five grams of oil every day, free oil. And that cured his angina. I think Amazing. that's such an important message because I will get a lot of people who will say to me, my blood pressure is really high. I tried eating plant based and it's just not coming down. And, you know, we'll talk about oils. We'll talk about fats and they'll say, you know, it just it's just sometimes 
It's just sometimes that I'm like, well, if you're in that desperate state where you absolutely need to get it down or we're risking a cardiac event, then, you know, let's let's make that next change. Let's let's take it out. But people are so convinced that it's just such a once in a while thing because we've been told that moderation is okay or balance is okay. But for some people, that moderation or that balance is just not what's going to save their life. Yes, I agree. And generally, humans tend to uh, forget what they ate soon after they eat it, too. That tends to be a, whether selective that's a protection, memory. <laughs> selective memory is a common thing amongst all of us. So so here's the thing, like, you're dealing with patients, we were in this situation where we were sick at one point, and we made a shift. And we've talked about this many times on the show, but I want to get your perspective on it. How do we get people to realize the importance of their nutrition and want to make a change before they have to make that change? You know what I mean? Like before yeah. somebody gets sick, let's take care of it. Let's be preventative. But most people don't want to make a change unless they have to. You know what I mean? I do. You know, the way I would look at that is John McDougall is. um uh, circulated some uh, papers on the whole idea that we, we go around and we think about people as, oh, you've had a heart attack, so you're a heart patient. Thank God I'm okay and I'm well. Well, the bad news, and it sounds a bit like, you know, a, a nihilist and, and chicken little that the sky is falling, but the bad news is those of us who grew up in North America, if you do um, population studies on people over the age of 40, a very high proportion, way more than 40% of those people, more than 50% have evidence of vascular disease who are otherwise well. When you get up to the 60 and 70 age group, at least two thirds of those people have plaques ready to rupture, but they're totally uh, unaware of this. So that's why I don't generally start with that message in my program because it is kind of like a upsetting message, but it w we need to get away from thinking that I'll eat better when I'm sick because most of us have the, the precursor lesions in our arteries, most adults, that if that ruptured, we could be an apparently pretty healthy person, rupture the plaque and kill the patient. So, so disease is way more widespread than we appreciate from a lot of these uh, micro intravascular ultrasound studies showing that you need to get out of this attitude that that poor bugger has heart disease, but I'm lucky and I'm doing okay. Just because you look good on the outside doesn't mean your vasculature is not setting yourself up for a bad outcome. Well, that's exactly where Adam was, you know, 10 years ago, or he was 37 years old and his arteries were, were pretty filled up. You know, he, right. he was in a right. really bad state. He was an athlete. He, we, we weren't overweight. We thought we ate well and then boom, we're told that he's got heart disease. So it's shocking. Yeah, it, it, it is shocking. And you know, all the autopsies that reveal kids of the age of 10 who eat a standard North American diet are already starting that process. And I think a lot of the danger comes from a lot of the either vocabulary that could be coming from doctors or the way that patients are perceiving it, that when you get to a certain age, you have heart disease regardless. You're 70 years old, of course you might need a stint. You're 70 years old. You're 70 years old and you forgot where you parked your car. Well, everybody starts to lose their memory when they're that age. When in fact, a healthy body that's living a healthy lifestyle and eating a plant-based diet should not get to that point if we were to generalize. And exactly. we have doctors telling people that their blood pressure is kind of on the cuffs of being high, but that's okay because that's what the general population has. That doesn't make it okay. No, no. I mean, if you're comparing, you know, drinking patterns when you're in an AA group of how we all used to drink, you can all feel that 10 beers a day is probably an acceptable amount. So it all, it all depends on who you compare yourself to. And, and as you know, in populations that don't eat the way North Americans do, there's the population blood pressure is not 120 over 80 as a normal value is more like 105 over 60. So yeah, it's and the same thing when so and so lost weight. And now my God, they're so scrawny, they're going away to nothing. And yet that person now is actually at a healthy body weight, but the rest of their family is overweight. So the family thinks that they're they must be sick, or maybe they got terminal cancer, but it just has to do what our perspective uh, normal is, right? So yeah, I, I think that 
the concern now that I have is that our teenagers that we have in society are eating poorly and they're not interested in making changes or looking long term because they're living in the moment. They're the youngsters, they're growing and their parents don't know the education when it comes to nutrition and how to feed them properly. What can we say to these young people who are going to grow up in a society, hopefully that will be a little bit healthier because Canada's food guide has made a shift and hopefully that will have an impact. But what could we say to get them to start thinking along this term of how food is not just fuel for every day, but it's for longevity and for overall health and performance? I've got tremendous hope in the future. I'm starting to sound like, you know, some of the uh, village elders, but I really, really do have tremendous hope for the future because I find I find the 15, the 24 year old age group, they're not cursed with um, in some ways uh, blind faith compliance like my generation maybe was more like when the authority said it, we just believed it. And the generation over me, they were very much you'd never challenged the physician on their position. You never challenged clergy. So now, now that the, that shift in a degree of skepticism, and yes, too much skepticism and cynicism is not healthy in some ways, but it's also protective because I think, I think the teenagers are are not into uh, taking a lot of advertising BS and taking it for face value. I, I have tremendous hope that that the, that they when they hear this message, this resonates with a lot of young people. And then, related to that too, coming to the same sort of end result is. Is, is young people, like I grew up on a farm and we, uh, you know, it's not a very nice thing to say, but like we, we, we chopped the head off of chickens. We did, we, we did stuff that now when I think back, I think I, I, like, it's like, my God, I, I it, was, it was like another like serial killer part of my life. Like we actually did that and we're kind of numb to it and realizing how do we treat those animals? Young people today hear that kind of story and they, they, they can't even believe that animals are treated the way they are. So in the same way, I, I have tremendous hope. And now with the Canada Food Guide, I have tremendous hope that young people, that yes, the 30 to 50-year-olds are unhealthy, but the, the younger, younger people are skeptical enough and challenging enough to realize that, you know, we've been fed a lot of nonsense about beef and dairy and these high-financed uh, industries that they're not buying the argument that those foods are necessary. And I, I, I tend to think young people are, uh, are really going to be heavily impacted by the Canada Food Guide. I have tremendous hope. That's, uh, that was one of the best bits of news I've experienced in the past seven years of this whole plant-based thing. We were really excited too. And I think it's going to be, like you said at the beginning, the children coming home and teaching the parents about it because mm -hmm. the parents aren't going to be finding out on their own. And I think that we have a smart young generation of kids out there and they're definitely going to reap the benefits a lot better than we have because it, it's going to start that much earlier for them. So thank you so much for that message. I think it's important for everybody to hear. If anybody wanted to reach out to you or find out what's going on with you and your practice and all of that, where would you like them to take a look? Well, you can find us on the internet at our website, williamscardiology.com. And we also have a Facebook page as well, Williams Cardiology and Wellness and um, you can find out about our programs there as well. We've recently expanded our programs to not only include the lunch and learn, but because of the emotional trip ups that people have and the emotion around eating, we've started uh, uh, teaching some of our patients uh, MBSR techniques for meditation and incorporating a yoga program as well. Realizing again the wisdom of Dean Ornish was that is is that these other lifestyle tools need to be in the toolbox because we tend to get off track for reasons that are way beyond nutrition. Amazing. Dr. Williams, the work you're doing is making a huge impact and it's amazing that it's happening so close to us here in Canada and hopefully more cardiologists, more family doctors are going to jump on board and start understanding the impact that a plant-based diet has on our health in making our society a healthier place. We want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Plant Trainers Podcast, and we really look forward to catching up with you soon in person. Thank you very much, and thanks for giving me a, an opportunity to speak about it. And 
Thanks for the work you guys are doing. All the best. Thank you all so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. We want to make sure that you subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or any other podcasting platform. We really appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it really helps other people find us just like you did. Thanks so much to our patrons. To become a patron, visit us at patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference in the quality of the show. And don't forget to connect with us on Instagram and Twitter. Our handle is at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at planttrainers.com for awesome recipes, a list of our services, and of course, our latest podcast. We encourage you to email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so that we can help you improve your quality of life through nutrition and fitness. So we hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and and have have a a healthy healthy day. day. Or is that too corny? It's a little cheesy.